Okay, then uh, then let's start. Today, we I will do a very short reminder of what MLP is, and then explain how we do recursive processing. And since we understand the transformer, which is an advancement which comes from statistical machine translation, I will also give an introduction to this, and then show that RNNs, if we couple them. This encoder decoder are a certain instance for statistical machine translation with a conditional language model. And this explains why they are used exactly the way they are used. And if you got this, and this is the aim of today's lecture, we have uh, quite far. The next lecture then will show how we improve this conditional language model by the introduction of attention, the idea of self attention, and positional encoding and multi head attention and a few smaller things. And then you have all elements of the traditional transformer at your hand. But the main thing of understanding, and I learned this also from, from Christopher Manning, is to understand what statistical machine translation did and how the people wanted to make this work. Okay, then uh, what will we learn today, see today, as I said already, a short, um, recap or reminding of what we do with MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons. I do this because I want to be always self-contained. We have had a certain break with regard to my lecture and I want you to directly enter it from the very beginning. And um, then I train with you the recurrency and then we go to statistical machine translation. Um, we have also prepared a completely new slide desk, about 200 slides. And from these, we will show you today about the first 100. No worries, most of them are animations are not so much. They will be on our web pages. Um, the news version will be there, I would say this evening or tomorrow morning. And for those who do self-study of deep learning, I would like to give um, short advice. Um, start if you try to understand from ground off this um, logistic regression, then neural networks, and then come a few um, parts like support vector machines, decision trees, and Bayesian learning, which you don't need. After this advanced NLPs here, you directly continue with recurrent neural networks. They directly connect to each other, these slides. They are separated here because the introductory course does not contain deep learning. But if you want to recap this, don't be confused. Go from advanced multi-layer perceptrons to recurrent neural networks. Okay, and this is what I will do um, very, very quickly. Um, We want to do a certain learning, and um, I present this here because I would today call this kind of stationary learning. Stationary means, we say this in Kubernetes, without time. X is a multi set of features, and we have C, a set of classes, and then I have these pairs here. And when we train, we learn to associate X with C. And we then get such stationary situations. That means these points are there and they do not move. We have green points and red points and we separate them. And what we finally do is we do some kind of regression. And what recurrent networks do, and they put this regression into the time dimension in addition. But it still remains a regression. And the time is compiled into the so-called um, states of the hidden vectors. The architecture which we have is more or less the same like we see here, three layers. And um, we have some input, here you see the input, we have the hidden layer, one hidden layer, and we have the output. And we are working with two matrices. hidden matrix 
which is here. And um, output matrix, which is here. We then take this as a standard function and compute this value. It means we, we plug in the values, the x in this time, uh, um, in this uh, case, and uh, compute this function, normal function computation. It's called forward propagation, but this is only a name. And um, we have also backward propagation, and this is something special. The value that we compute can be compared to a desired value. And then we can modify our function. In fact, we modify the two matrices. And uh, we have this error curve, which we see here, which tells us something in which direction we have to change the matrices. The algorithm which does this is a so-called incremental gradient descent. And it has four main blocks and it's for each loop. So for each loop tries each sample, it evaluates the function, like you do this if you evaluate a normal function like Zeno's. It calculates the residuals. That means the difference from the expected. It uh, tells how to change the weights, and it updates the weights. This is a fairly trivial algorithm, and I show this again here because this algorithm is also used to train deep, uh, um, deep networks. Yeah? What is different with deep networks is that they are deeper, that we have probably shortcuts in them, that we have perhaps improved um, loss functions, but in fact, this algorithms at heart is running there as well. I introduced already a few refinements, uh, soft marks and cross entropy also, but uh, these are not so important now. Keep only in mind that they are there. We now start with RNNs. And um, we have organized these slides for you according along with three tasks. And um, they, these, these three tasks are also organized similarly, and um, I will explain you this before and so that you, if you get tired and leave this session, or if you want to learn it from your own, that you refine this. We announce this task, we call it, for instance, sequence to class. This means we are getting, uh, getting a sequence and want to assign its proper class. The second task is class to sequence. And the third task is sequence to sequence. In fact, in statistical uh, language processing, we have um, only sequence to sequence, but there are certain tasks where we also uh, need S1 and S2. Again, these three tasks are similarly organized. I um, will, for the first two tasks, explain how encoding and decoding works. This is where they are served for. I will give for each task an example, and I will for each task show the mapping of the network and the mathematics. And um, I will repeat this for S1, S2, and S3, so that you can compare them. And um, if you get a bit lost in between, or if you want to have an overview, what are all these colors mean? I've provided for you this notation legend. We use for hidden vectors, um, violet. Hidden vectors are these here. Yeah. We use for input vectors, gray. And we use for output vectors, blue. And you see also this played or checked uh, vectors. These all are vectors, two rows of vectors. We count seven or so. We use also these checked vectors. 
and um, I will explain what this means. We, we say this is an output vector, but if it is defined by our wish, what we want to see in the output, and this output is a very trivial thing, like a start word or an end word, we use this. This is not knowledge bearing. If you go to the slides, um, we also say this. There's a special kind of vector I would also like to show. This vector is somehow split. It has a blue part and a plate, a checked part. Yeah? And, and the, the plate part is, um, stands uh, for the case that we have a target thing. And the blue part is that we have computed something. And there are cases in recurrency where we use that what we compute to feed in, in the network again. And in this case, we have the choice between to feed in our computed value or to feed in the target value. This is um, very intricate what to do in, from a learning perspective. Normally, I thought at the beginning that it's always good to feed in the target value because it has not an error. But if you feed in the computed value from the incomplete network, you can speed up the learning process. What to feed in is not so easy, but you will see this here, that there are places where we can feed in something that we produce, and this can be the target or um, our computed output. Okay. And these lines here indicate that there are the matrices. And in fact, although uh, it looks that there are several matrices, in fact, there are only two. This WH here, and this WO here. And uh, what we see here is an unfolded version of the network, and I explain how this emerges in the next few seconds. Um, you can take your time. This is completely explained. What I've told you, it's also written here on the remarks, and there are examples given, and there you can read this. But for now, it's okay that I go over this, and you need to keep in mind the hidden vectors, these are the violet ones, and they are the most interesting thing in our network computation. Okay. The first task, this is uh, something which um, I introduced a few weeks ago, but now with improved slides, I will repeat it again. Um, is uh, We are giving a sequence, a sentence, for instance, and we have to find out its sentiment. Yeah, we learn this from examples. We have um, examples where we see a sentence and we see its sentiment. For instance, I love my cat. Here, I see this, this here is a nice sentence. And I give this sentence, um, let's say, so a positive sentiment. Yeah. And from these things, um, I can learn. And what we first have to learn is or to see, to admit that we have a sentence as input, not a stationary input, because the sentence does not come all of a sudden, it comes word by word. Of course, we could emulate it, it comes in parallel, but this is untypical. It comes word by word. And what we now do is we start, um, hence I've uh, shown this here in the upper right corner, we in fact start from, from this network here again, yeah? um, which is characterized by these uh, three things. Yes, uh, p-dimensional input, two hidden layers, one hidden layer, one output layer, nothing uh, fancy. And then we say we feed into this network a sequence. And uh, this means that we have to take one vector x after the other and feed it in and in this, we do this feeding in, this, this squeezing in of the sequence by updating over the time this hidden vector. And this update over the time, this unfolding is shown here. Yeah? We go from here to here. Yeah? And here you see the entire matrix again. Yeah? We have still only one hidden matrix, but now we have it at different time points. You can think of it that there's a certain fixed memory place where the matrix is living in there and over the time it changes. And during this change, we compute different hidden vectors and to speak is, it is called, we encode the input sequence into this hidden vector. This hidden vector will later become 
the encoded condition of our input. The last hidden vector takes it all. And this will also, you know, understand why this is a problem. In fact, which you see directly here, if we have a very long sentence, the last hidden vector takes it all means and that the longer the sentence is, the, the easier the, the, we will forget about changes that happened all during the time. This is a so-called vanishing gradient problem. Anyway, uh, we will later see how this bottleneck can be overcome with attention, but for now it is important to see that we encode step by step our knowledge here. This encoding happens quite trivially, but um, I found it interesting to show it to you. We start with the input and some constant hidden vector. At the beginning, we have no hidden vector to update. We take a vector of zeros. We start with a random weight hidden matrix and compute some stupid first hidden vector. And we take this hidden vector and take our next input, yeah, you, you see this here. Sorry. So this is at the, the X2. And um, again, we compute from this the hidden vector and then we get to X3 and so on. And if you enroll this, you can see how what we do moves through the time, yeah? What we see enrolled on the right hand time uh, uh, side is the time, it's not the space. We will now use this um, machinery or let's say this architecture to solve our problem. So we are given this task. We have here, we see uh, five example sensors. This is our database. And from this we learn. And the vocabulary which you see here, this is not written by accident to show you are these are our words. This is important to see that only these words which we see here, which, which we use here are recognized by the network. That means if we work with our network, we can understand in quotes only and produce in quotes only these kinds of words. And all other words which we might encounter are out of vocabulary. You might have heard this out of vocabulary problem. There are things to work against this. The easiest way to have a really big corpus, not only these five examples, but with these five examples already this works. We will put each word that you see here. <clears throat> We will feed them into the network. And the question is how we encode them. And um, this encoding from the input is usually called embedding. We can also call it embedding here. And there's interesting, uh, interesting things that we can do. Um, I will show here, we will show here a very simple embedding, the so-called one hot encoding. There are people who even won't call this an embedding, but it's also a very simple embedding. And we use this so that we better understand our example and to keep it um, easy. Yeah? And that means our, our vector, which you see here, can be formalized or embedded with these four hot encodings. And in this um, one hot encodings, four one hot encodings, you see zeros everywhere and at one place a one. And this one indicates the word in the vocabulary. And the word in number 11, yeah, if I have to count this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, uh, should, be, should be I, yeah. And in this way, we encode the entire sentence. I'll show you this uh, because to remove um, all, um, let's say, hidden knowledge or all magic, because there is no magic at all. This is what we see here, these four vectors then represent, I love my cat. Of course, these are only numbers, yeah? but they represent this. And that we understand them as a, sem as a semantics, uh, like we um, use them is only in our mind. This is a pure illusion. The output is uh, pretty clear. Um, we have for each example, 
information, whether it's positive or negative. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, with this, I connect this now to the to the, this slide. This is a bit full. This slide, but. Um, um, we will later on in the next uh, reading also uh, use an abstraction from this, but for the moment we find it very interesting to connect the mathematics uh, to the network architecture. And we distinguish between input, hidden, target and output. And all these things have their place in this uh, network. Yeah? So the input is here, yeah? one after the other, of course, yeah? but this is the input. The output here, and now I, I would uh, like to show this, this output here tells us the last hidden vector. Look at this. This is really the interesting point. The last hidden vector, this one, is used and multiplied with the output matrix. And then you have the sigma one, this is a, this is a soft max function, then we get the probabilities for one for um, positive sentiment and one for negative sentiment. That means the output is only computed here from these two things. What I also want to express with this, the mathematics is not something which I've written here. It looks like this formula. These are exact the formulas which are processed and used. And if you find an error, tell us. You should be able to take this drawing and do the compute, uh, the, the programming of, of the learning. The hidden vectors are more or less then clear. They show that the hidden matrix is multiplied with the input and the hidden vector from the previous time step. And the target, yeah, quite simple. It's only this vector with the classes. And uh, to make it a bit um, comprehensible, more comprehensible, each of these mappings is equipped with the exact example. Yeah? And then we have also updated the mass here. We have four input vectors, the one hot encoded things. We have these four hidden vectors. We, you see here the target vector with these two entries, the plus and nothing. And um, this is exactly the thing that we, that we use. And this does the job. And with, with this understanding, you see that we have squeezed the time by subsequently processing the inputs into this last hidden vector, which is a condition which we will later use in the um, encoder-decoder coupling. A bit background information. Um, important for me is this. We use exactly the IGD algorithm as before. It has a model function evaluation, the calculation of the residuals, the derivatives, and then we do the update of the vector, and this is one step in gradient descent. That means all mechanisms that you learned by now are applied in deep learning as well. And uh, the next slide is not uh, very well designed. I would like to skip this, but uh, only to show you that we did not avoid to show the truth. Look only at this field here, please. Uh, <laughs> what you see here, is um, the computation of the network, yeah, the forward propagation and the input and, uh, and the hidden states and the output. Uh, but the abstraction might be more useful for you. Okay. Um, having given you this introduction and a short recap, we can now go one step Further, and we will, we will do this. We go uh, to our task. Everything fine? Can you hear me? Yep, we can. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. I hope this was not too annoying voice and uh, noise for you. Everything's good? No feedback. Niklas or Martin? Yeah, as usual. Ah, as usual. Very good. Thank you. I did. Um, I had uh, to re. Um, to re edit the micro. Okay. 
Let's start with S2. S2 is more tricky. You, you will see this. And by S1 was clear, we accumulate the, the time and uh, then have one signal. S, S2 is more tricky. And the reason is the following. Um, the reason is that we do not only input one signal here, a positive sentiment signal, and then get the entire sentence. No, we put in at the beginning the positive signal, then the positive signal plus the i, then the positive signal plus the i plus the love, and so on. We do have something that is usually done in so-called language models, and I will illustrate this now step for step, and we have also prepared the slides that you see this. And um, I find this uh, class to sequence things is a more trickier part of the encoder decoder um, machinery. Again, we start with this network because we use this trivial MLP network, but instead of adding the time here at the beginning, we now add the time here, the sequence at the end. And um, what happens then is during computation, we produce with a network, a first vector here. And then we use this first vector here as input and then compute the second vector and so on and so on. It means all these vectors that we produce become at some point in time also our input. Here you see the un fold hidden and output layer again. And here you uh, see what I mean. We produce some, some output value, which then becomes also the input to update the hidden vector. And as before, the last hidden vector contains all knowledge up to this point. And the last hidden vector then is able to output the last word. The last word, this is uh, normalized. This should be the word end or stop. Here's some background, which I have probably told or not. You can read this um, if you go through your slides on your own. I show you also here an animation of what happens. We have some input vector and here you see at the beginning, this is a special thing. We are we start with a with a, with a plate or um, etched version, um, because at the beginning we define we have a, a standard input like a, a, a constant start word. We we need this to have the syntax clean. You will see this in a moment if we have the entire network um, in our processing. We also start with some hidden vector. And these two things give us the first update of a hidden vector at time point one, which we then use to produce our output. And this output and the new hidden vector both are used to produce the next hidden vector. And here you see also what I showed you before. We can use our own output in the so-called test phase, but we can also use the, the, the target value that we want to see. In the training phase, we do this. And then we get our output at time point two. And we use these values and the updated hidden values to compute our output at time point three. And as before, we move through the time. Yeah, you see this small um, difference which I do here. We, we compute an output. That means we uh, hence have also only highlighted the first thing. This is our private output which comes on the network. But what we do in the next step is at our disposal. Now yeah? we can decide going with our or going with the target. Yeah? And um, this difference is also shown here. Why? This why I denote the values, the output values that we produce with C 
we denote the, the target value. And if you go to our notation and color coding, you, you, can, you can read this information. This is all shown here. Um, also the colors that we use, if you get confused at some point in time, you can simply look at this. Well, um, how can we solve the problem now with this? Um, again, we have a knowledge base and this knowledge base, this data set D, we should can stick carefully to our uh, letters. This is this is D, yeah, the famous data set D. This has examples where we see a sentiment and a, a sentence associated with this. And the idea is not that a plus generates this entire sentence. This would not make sense. Look, this is not a, a function. A plus cannot uh, create this sentence, a second sentence. In fact, it is more intricate. A plus might hint us to a word which is very positive, for instance, I or cat. And with these two things, a plus and the I, I might think, what is the next useful word? And this could be love or plus and cat. The next word could be dog. No, no, not dog. We have a vocabulary as before, and we can only be in within this vocabulary. That means if we invent or produce these words, they have to be from this vocabulary because we train our network with this vocabulary. And um, don't be confused at the beginning. The input now changes and is increasing. And I've animated this a bit. Um, we do not start with X only. Let's um, highlight this uh, X. Is this plus? We do not start with the X only. We start with the X and the constant start word. And with these two things, with these two vector inputs, yeah, we have the one hot encoded, not a problem, you know what it is. We can produce the first output. Then we take this output. Here you see, becomes our input. And now you see the recursion here and to produce a second word, and so on. And when we train such a system, we say, we expect at our last word, the word end. This is not a problem to, to add here in the training set. Oh, sorry, the key was not correctly connected. It is not a problem to add the word end here and in our training set. The problem is that later on, when we have trained the machine, that we have to wait until the end is produced by the network. And perhaps this never happens, or this happens much too late. That means we are distinguished between the end point in time tau, which is the end point in time of the production process until finally the word end comes, and our end in time in the training situation, T, which is the truth. You see, they look quite similar. Tau, T, yeah? This is the difference we make here. And uh, you will see uh, that we talk about our produced values, Y of tau and our truth, C of T. This is important to see this um, difference because this will lead later in the transformer to the so-called masking that we do not want to look in the future and so on. But um, back to this animation, you should understand how we feed the network. And here you will see also the target. And the target, you see, has a, has a word end. The word 22, if you count this, it's 20 second word. And again, I will show you the mapping between the network and the mass. And um, you can compare this to the mapping which we had before. 
In this task, we have now the mapping from class to sequence, which is a bit more tricky. <coughs> This is the input. That means our first signal plus. And then one after the other, these produce, produce um, or known values. Why are the produced values? C are the target values. The output is computed in each step. Look here, WO. Yeah? We have this matrix here. This is here, exactly here, this WO. And we use this matrix and we use this vector here. Yeah, exactly what you see here and compute this value. From time step one to tau, you see, uh, we don't know when it stops. Yeah. The hidden values are quite uh, clear. There is a so-called WI, which is necessary as a special matrix for embed this usually low dimensional class here. Nothing special, consider it like a hidden matrix. And important, the matrix WH. This matrix WH can get either, as you see it here, the input from the truth, or our computed values. I have shown this now from several sides, always the same thing. But this is important because this is something which we have to understand if we do training and which leads us to certain properties of masking and other things in the transformer. If you more or less understood what we did here, we are more or less done. And the most difficult thing is done. The target is quite clear. The target is given my sentence which I want to have. And the last word of the target is always the same like the last word of as our output, the word end. <clears throat> here you see it illustrated with an example, also the updates here with, with the numbers. Um, we start with the very first input of the plus and the start, which then gives us a first output, which then is added to the input and so on. And finally, the input consists of X, up to y at time point four. The output canonically, nothing special, I explained before. And um, here I see this green color indicates this, that we feed in the target, but we could also feed in our produced output. And to remind you that the machine can output anything, I've also output something different here. Cats love water. And you see the sentence produces the end one too early and the whole sentence does not fit. But uh, you might have seen this already with Niklas and the prompt engineering thing. It is one thing to train a network. It is another thing to let the network produce things that you want to see. Um, sorry, I don't know. This was, ah, yeah. This is a hint um, distinguished between the, the training time and the test time that we have different ways to update the hidden matrix and the hidden vectors. And again, this here is the IGD algorithm, which does the job. This, it takes um, the residuals at the end, looks how far is our sentence from the true sentence, and then propagates the error back. What we get out here, these three matrices, this is our model. Somebody says, uh, who has, uh, he, is, he or she has a model, 
then he or she is talking about these matrices. And if they're talking about number of parameters, they're talking about the parameters of these matrices. And you can stack them, you can make them bigger, you can um, embed the sentences in several thousand dimensions. And this is the reason why uh, that these number of parameters go up in the millions. This here is our model. Okay. Okay. This um, was um, a read intro and a recap and reminding of the things that we need now to use recurrent neural networks, and we will use them now at the place where they in fact come from. What I've trained or showed to you was the encoding and decoding, but actually the first RNNs that were built were directly built from statistical machine translation. And this nice splitting in these two parts was not so obvious. I will bring this now, because um, I found it very enlightening. And I also saw that Christopher Manning found it also very enlightening. <coughs> And this is um, a taxonomy of um, statistical machine translation things. No, not of machine translation in general. Machine translation can be done rule-based. Yeah, you have rules how to do things. And um, I would like to point out this. It's a very good idea and it's still an important thing to go into some intermediate language and use this to uh, the, take Chomsky's idea. That's the universal language in which everything can be translated. Very nice idea. It does not really work, but then there is a big field of statistical machine translation, which is what is practically done, in fact, uh, until today. And Google's machine translation, uh, Google Translate, worked uh, with this method until 2018. And we are talking usually about um, a word based, sorry, a word based thing. And what Afterwards came, which is now the top dog, and uh, moved removed everything. What was there is neural machine translation. It, perhaps you have heard about LSTM, a precursor of um, attention ide attention ideas. But in fact, the true thing is what we need is, is this here in regard neural networks. And um, if you, you see how how modern these things are, then you understand also how difficult this is to, to get uh, track with this because it, there's no months, there are no improve, which does not pass without any improvement about this technology. It's also for us quite difficult to, to keep, um, uh, to follow this development. And um, we discussed this quite often in our group and we thought it is good to understand not the last details every week, but to have a very good understanding where the mathematics comes from, because this will not change. And if you have understood this, you can also follow the new de uh, development. Yes, new, uh, new machine translation can be understood if we understand statistical machine translation. And this was an insight I got from, um, from Christopher Manning again. And um, the statistical machine translation has the idea of a so-called noisy channel. We have a parallel corpus, it means a corpus with two languages where one should be translated into the other, or vice versa. And we compute a probabilistic model, which sentences are likely to occur together. Or let's say the probability of observing a sentence Y in the one corpus, when we have observed the sentence X at the parallel place, the other corpus. This can be uh, computed. And um, the noisy channel model, it says we have only seen some part of the truth, some output. Uh, I've illustrated this a bit. Um, we see this is a noisy channel, this tube here, and we see only this here. Yeah, I love my cat. And uh, probably you know uh, Plato's a cave alleg allegory. Uh, we don't know what was put into this channel, yeah? And uh, the noisy channel um, analogy says, we observe the sentence X and we ask ourselves what happened on the other side. We 
speak German only, and somebody wanted to say something in German to us, but the noisy channel scrambled it completely and it came out in English. This is the official metaphor. And we are now have the job to find the most probable German sentence. Yes, we have to think about what could have been said here. Yeah? The probability of a Gliebe meine Katze, if I observe, this is a condition, and now you understand the word condition, why I said it so often before, it's a condition um, which I see. Yeah? The condition of a German sentence given in English sentence. The condition of a sentence in our own language given a sentence in a foreign language. The condition of Y under X. And this uh, leads to the task, giving a sentence here, giving a sentence. Yeah. We do not want to translate this, no. We want to find the most probable thing on the other side of the channel. And by accident, we use this as translation. This is how, how they argue with the computer language. And we find this if we maximize this probability. Not a big deal, we can simply compute this probability for all sentence combinations a few billion, and then we have it. And the maximum is a, the best translation. They do it not in that stupid way, by naive checking everything. They do it a bit different. And the most obvious thing is that they do not apply to compute this directly. Which German sentence fits best the English observed one? They apply base rule beforehand. Probably you know base rule, if not, base rule is a reversal of cause and effect, if you want to, of condition and the consequence. And um, you see it here on the right hand side, P of Y under X, and then you see this uh, fraction is P of X under Y times P of Y divided by P of X. This here is called likelihood. This is called prior. This is called normalizing constant. And um, um, in the ArcMax expression on the left-hand side, we have, we have omitted this normalizing constant. We can, we can of course write this here, yeah, P of X. But um, since it does not depend on the, uh, on the variation the variable Y, we can al also replace it by a one. And the ArcMax um, of the left-hand side and the ArcMax of the right-hand side and the ArcMax of this fraction is all the same. What you also should be look careful if you like to understand this, but it's only a side note. We distinguish between a big P and big letters and a small P and small letters. And um, this is the basis to define a probability measure. And this is the function to compute probabilities. The argument of the, the X of the big P is always an event. And X is a random variable, and we say X, and then is a sentence, I love my cat. And um, if we only work with the, in the domain of the random variables, um, we do not forget about um, this big P, we use only the small P, and um, use this as a function that gives us for the random variable domain the value. And uh, I explain this here because this difference is important if you want to do more Bayesian things later on. Um, I have explained it on the slides, here in the, on the notation. You can read it only here that you are not confused. This is not a writing error. This is very clearly thought when we use a big P and a small P. Okay, anyway, um, why do they work with this base thing? This is a question. Why not work directly on this formula? And this is really smart why they do this. If we want to learn y under x, we have to swallow every sentence which we get in the corpus. And there are good sentences, there are bad sentences. And by splitting this with regard to base, we can do a very smart thing. And we can focus on those sentences which are probable, which we like, which are useful for the domain, and which are verified. That means um, we can control the vocabulary and the sentence of our translation quality. Hence, this P 
P of I is called language model. It's, it takes care of the fluency, let's say the casuality in the target language. If you know NetSpeak, it's something that NetSpeak does. We look at things that are quite often. Typically, the language model is computed like if you know it, like you know it. We compute the probability of a sentence as a product of the, depending on the order of the condition probabilities. The, uh, the probability of I love my, uh, of, um, sorry, of probability of cat and under I love my is much higher than the probability of cat under dog. The second element is a so-called translation model. The translation model is the likelihood. And this tells us something about the fidelity between the two languages. And normally this is um, uh, optimized with, um, um, yeah, I know, forgot it, um, some uh, um, hidden variable algorithms um, like um, not the tabby algorithm, there are much stronger things. Uh, I forgot the name, sorry. And we'll come to this. Oh, sorry? Yeah, not a Markov change. There's an algorithm which does this. Um, um, oh, sorry for this. And it means, uh, but anyway, thank you. We do not compute uh, Px under y. We, in fact, compute Px and some alignment vector, which tells us whether and how and how far words uh, move. Yeah. And these hidden variables are normalized um, uh, trained. Not a trivial thing, but if we have these two things, we can compute for each sentence and each pair of two languages sentence um, their value and then shows the maximum. And this is done for friends of symbolic computing with heuristic search. In fact, yeah, with beam search, for instance, with I star search and so on and so on. And this is how the people did this until 2017 or partly do it today. These three elements make up a machine translation model according to statistical idea. Here's some background. Now, neural machine translation. Neural machine translation replaces this model and it is an end-to-end -end model, which means, uh, I will explain later what this means. Um, it has two parts, which you know already, a so-called encoder which tries to take a sentence X and represent it in a compact form. This will become the last hidden vector, will be the encoded value. And the decoder, which is called conditional language model. It is a language model. It means it is something like this here. Something like this. And now don't be confused. You see here a condition as well, but this condition is not meant. With a conditional language model, it is meant, it is conditioned on the input. That means on the vector, hidden vector here on the RNN encoding. And the optimization, the loss optimization now is done as a whole, means end to end. And I have uh, given one note on end to end here uh, because this is always a bit confusing. End to end is not an architectural feature of this network. Every network works somehow end to end. End to end is a philosophy to say we do not uh, apply the paradigm of um, divide and conquer and consider input out example in an indivisible manner. And this does mean end to end. And um, this translates now as follows. We see here the, the noisy channel model. And we were wondering before, if I observe I love my cat, then I encode I love my cat here in, in this vector here. And then I train a decoder. Yeah, it's also called decoder. It fits very well. Um, here on this side, which finds the most probable sentence which could have been on the left-hand side. This is the idea of 
a neural machine translation. And this is done in an end-to-end -end way, and this directly computes y under x. It's not a splitting uh, with base root anymore. I will also show you this because this is very insightful to understand it. This is really a move. And this move didn't work a few years. Uh, this was not the first time in 2019 or 17 when I tried this. I tried this years before. But uh, the few smaller things that I did to the transformer brought the break breakthrough. Um, we directly calculate this. That means y under x is y1 under x times y2 under y1 comma x and so on and so on and so on until y tau. I bring now an example with this and come back to the this this uh, and connect these two things. Clear what we see here now. We have uh, two languages. We have examples here. Yeah, this is our set D as before, our parallel corpus, if you want so. Yeah. We have two vocabularies. That means we can be in or out on two sides. Be careful with these. Yeah. Our input looks quite pretty like we saw the decoder of things. Yeah? We start with a completely encoded input sentence. Before, this was only the plus. Now it is a sentence. And then we produce one word, and this will become the new input, and so on and so on. It means the only difference to before is that we, instead of the plus, encode the entire sentence. More or less a repetition of the slide before. The target is clear. Ich liebe meine Katze, sie soll rauskommen. Yeah, should be the result. I love my cat. Is what I observe. And this soll rauskommen means is the most probable sentence. Let's look at the mass. And then let's connect uh, uh, statistical language processing and RNNs. The mass also, no surprise anymore. Here's the input. The output this time is also a sequence, sequence to sequence. Yeah. Here we see the encoder and the decoder. And uh, take the word for serious, the decoder in statistical machine translation was a heuristic search process. This is replaced by a search which we do with training. So the output, then the hidden thing. There are two kinds of hidden vectors, the encoded hidden vectors here, yeah. And the decoded hidden vectors here. And in the middle, they join, yeah. This, this vector contains the knowledge of the input sentence. And this vector is decoded. This is official speak. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, this is uh, the basis for deeper, but not the success for deeper. Um, um, if you do this, yes, if you do this and now fine tune this with fantastic corpora, with good learning uh, and loss functions, yes. This is, it is also the basis of the Google Translate, meanwhile. It is a yeah, who is else there? Google changed from statistical machine translation 2018 only. This is very interesting. They were so good in this. But um, this here is much cheaper. Um, with this knowledge which I give you, you cannot beat DeepL, but you are able to understand how they do this. And then you can work there, or you can think about, or you can read the high end papers who, who show you which level of stacking in the transformer or which number of multi-heads or which kind of attention computation you do. But um, first you have to understand this here. And um, 
I think with the statistical machine translation, it becomes uh, quite clear. Okay, these were the hidden. Here are the target sentence. And I've also brought again the example. Yeah, I love my cat. Start, yeah, I have to, to say this. Start is so we part. This, however, is somehow without knowledge. Hence, we have this here checked. And this is then um, generated, um, hopefully generated. Ich liebe meine Katze, this is um, in in a training situation and here in test situation. Yeah. And uh, you can see the numbers, they are all adapted so that you can exactly see what, what we are doing here. It means again here, this um, ticker does not only show the months, it shows also part of the algorithm. Here's some background. I jump over this. I want to close, um, more or less done in five minutes or two minutes, point to the fact that RNNs are conditional language models. This is what I do. And um, I want to point to um, this here. It's an example of a conditional language model because it's a language model. The decoder is predicting the next word. And it's conditional because it's conditioned on the source sentence. It's conditioned on this vector. And this vector will play a role in the next reading when we talk about attention. But for now, I, I want to, to connect this also. We directly calculate this here, y under x. You see the formula as before. And you directly see what we do here in the, in the network here is a complete mass. And in fact, this here is the probability of ich after I have seen, I love my cat. This is x and start, this is and uh, we see probabilities here because we have here the softmax function. <laughs> this is the probability of ich under I have seen that. This is the probability of Liebe after I have seen blah, blah, blah. Is the probability of cat. And we should understand this, that this approach, this whole thing is a replacement for this year. And so everything makes sense. Yeah. I'm looking at other still slides to show, sorry. No, this is all I wanted to show for today. And um, I want to let you part of the insight which I got when I again learned about statistical language models and um, how the at first sight complicated encoder decoder structure architecture is only a thing to compute the base formula and train it with a neural network and our training algorithms. And what makes this so successful is it is so cheap to train a neural network. You can make it bigger if you have computing resources, you can add parameters, you can make the core power bigger. It is so easy. And this explains the success of this architecture altogether. This architecture has a problem, which we will address next week. This architecture has a bottleneck here. It's the first problem. And the second problem of this architecture, it takes time. If you have a long sentence, we can only start training after you've seen the input. All things will be repaired with attention and self-attention next week. Okay, then I can only say thank you for listening. We are done for the moment. And if there are any questions, you're welcome.